It is 2008 and state Chinese television is showing a new method to treat internet and computer game addiction. The show is called Fighting the Internet Demon, who turned our geniuses into beasts. It features a man nicknamed Tesla Trooper Yang, and he's apparently found a way to treat those young internet riddled minds. This form of treatment wasn't new in 2008, however, and Yang's work would represent just another chapter in this medical procedure's history, which was well over 150 years old by the mid noughties There were many psychological medical interventions used freely in the early part of the 20th century that elicit nightmares. I mean, who would undergo insulin shock therapy for entertainment value? But there are a few that stick in the mind, excuse the pun, as a cultural memory of the brutal experiences of the mentally ill at the turn of the last century. One that jumps to mind is the lobotomy, although largely abandoned today, except for a few individual cases. I've already covered this, but the other treatment that was around at the same time and even used in conjunction with the ice pick was that of today's subject, electroconvulsive therapy. I remember from one of my visits to the Museum of the Mind at Bethlehem Hospital, the ECT machine on display. It had a rather ominous worded button, treat. This was to administer an electric shock to the patient or victim, whichever way you like to think about it. I feel this word explains rather well that people who used it did generally think it would help in most cases, but rather than used in select specific cases, ECT was given out indiscriminately, even as a form of punishment. Today we're going to dive into the world of ECT therapy. Welcome to the dark side of science. Early beginnings. Our story of ECT goes back surprisingly far, as far back as the first chemical batteries no less and two men in Italy, Alessandro Volta, Luigi Galvini. Volta, in the late 1790s, was working on an invention called the Volta Pile, and this was a very early battery. Galvini, around the same time, was working on using electricity to animate the limbs of dead frogs. He found if the limbs were struck by lightning, they moved. He was building upon Benjamin Franklin's use of lightning. Franklin had also used electricity on people for a curative treatment. He also found that they would move frog's legs if he simply touched a brass hook attached to the animal to a steel plate. Galvini had thought the animation was proof of animal electricity, a power which made all living things move. Volta, upon reading a book published in 1791 by Galvini on his animal electricity, thought instead of the power being within the animal, it was actually from the two metal objects touching. This led him to create the Volta Pile. A year after Galvini's death, he named the chemical action that creates electricity, galvanism. But what does this all have to do with ECT? Well, after Galvini's death in 1798, his work would be taken up by his nephew, Giovanni Aldini. Aldini would take his uncle's work animating dead frogs and up his game to animating dead people. Freshly dead bodies for scientific experiments were not the easiest thing to come by, but for one way, at the end of a hangman's noose. Aldini was able to procure the freshly dead body of convicted murderer George Forster in London. His execution took place on the 18th of January 1803 at Newgate. As soon as the man was hanged, the body was cut down and taken to Aldini in a nearby house. Aldini applied an electrical current to the deceased's face, and his jaw began to move, and an eye opened. Next, he put current through the dead body, and its arm raised with a clenched fist. Onlookers thought Forrester was coming back to life. He was not, and someone had noted that if he had, his sentence of hanged by the neck till death would still stand. A contemporary report of the event from the Newgate calendar stated, The professor, we understand, had made the use of galvanism also in several cases of insanity and with complete success. It was the opinion of the first medical men that this discovery, if rightly managed and duly processed, 
could not fail to be of great and perhaps as yet unforeseen utility. The first line of that statement is what's valuable here for us. You see, Aldini wasn't just electrifying the dead, but also the living. Over a lot of the 18th and 19th centuries, doctors and scientists experimented with inducing seizures for the treatment of the insane, and galvanism was just another method. Aldini wasn't also the only one to try this out. Scottish physician James Lind also experimented with electricity, again reporting positive results. Throughout the 19th century, galvanism was used in asylums and developed into electrotherapy. But it was at the time mainly a case of shock and see what happens as a means of subduing patients. Electroconvulsive therapy. So I'm going to skip some years forward for us to meet Hungarian neuropsychiatrist Ladislas J. Meduna. He, in 1934, had introduced a thing called convulsive therapy. He believed that schizophrenia could be alleviated by epileptic seizures. But how to cause such seizures? Well, Maduna started using chemical compounds for this effect, mainly camphor and metrazole. By the end of the decade, metrazole-induced convulsive therapy was widespread throughout the mental health industry. It was mainly employed upon schizophrenia. Metrazole, although caused seizures, was difficult to administer, in some cases requiring doctors to chase patients around wards in order to force administer the drugs. As such, someone thought to combine convulsive therapy with the widely employed shocking of asylum patients with electricity. And this is where Hugo Serletti joins our story. In April 1938, he undertook his first electroshock experiment on a human. Serletti's inspiration had come from seeing an abattoir using a 125 volt electric shock to knock out a pig before slaughter. Soletti and his assistant, Lucio Bini, devised that if the electric shock was applied straight to the head, reliable convulsions could be induced. Their first victim was in April 1938. This was a man affected by delusions, detained by the police. He was taken to the clinic for mental and nervous diseases in Rome. The police probably thought that this was the best place for the mentally ill patient, but Soletti and Bini saw this as a perfect opportunity. His head was shaved and he was taken to a lab in which a bed was placed next to an ECT machine. In their previous experiments with dogs, around half had died from cardiac arrest. Both men knew this time round could be the same and their treatment would quickly become an execution. 80 volts was passed across the patient's temple, then shortly after 90 volts. After a few minutes of rest, they sent a shock of 110 volts. The patient convulsed and turned blue he was becoming oxygen starved. But at 48 seconds, the seizure stopped and he returned to normal breathing. After several treatments over the coming months, the patient appeared to recover and return to a normal state of mind and was even later reunited with his family. Serletti and Binny developed their treatment and undertook a clinical trial. They found in a variety of cases that between 10 and 20 treatments were enough to see an improvement. They also found that patients post-treatment had amnesia of the therapy, meaning that unlike metrazole, the patient wasn't scared of the induced seizures. The treatment proved to be more controllable, cheaper and easier to administer than the chemical equivalent. The Italian's treatment spread across the UK and US, Australia and even Germany by 1940. And post-World War II, the treatment spread even further. Quickly, it was found that ECT was beneficial for other mental health conditions, most notable in depression. So, how does it work? The original machine built by Binny and Saletti had electrodes that were placed on each side of the patient's head. Around 120 volts of direct current was applied with the help of a sine wave, although the waveform would later be modified and the shock would last between 1 and 6 seconds. Now the dose level has to exceed the seizure threshold of the patient, but this is only known through trial and error. Some physicians started off with a standard dose and adjust, where others made an educated guess based on the patient's age, gender and weight. It is thought, although not actually clinically confirmed, that the electrical current creates neural elasticity, allowing the brain to rewire itself, hopefully improving the patient's symptoms. 
In its original form, ECT had issues with the side effects of memory disturbance, beyond the beneficial short-term amnesia and confusion. As such, Binney and Sir Letty experimented with their method and changed it up to use a unilateral electrode placement. In fact, only one side of the head would be wired up, meaning the current would only pass through a portion of the brain and not the whole thing. Another change was a step away from using sine waves to a short pulse wave. The original form was known as unmodified ECT and would be more prevalent throughout the 1940s and 1950s. But memory loss and confusion weren't the only side effects. Practitioners also noted a rare issue, fractures and dislocations of the patient's longer bones. This was due to the seizures being pretty full on. As such, a modified treatment was devised with the use of muscle relaxants and short-term anesthesia. This came into use in the early 1950s, but the treatment was already becoming known as a controversial procedure. In mental asylums, it was often administered without informed consent and used as punishment for unruly behaviour. Often, the threat alone was all that was required to keep order on the wards. And like lobotomies, it was administered to patients who would be more hurt rather than helped. ECT was also used on homosexual people in an effort to shock the gay out of them. Footage of ECT permeated to the wider public, affecting the way it was seen as more of a cruel act than a curing treatment. This in conjunction with its use on children and the lack of informed consent tainted the treatment in the realm of public opinion. falling out of favour. By the time the 1960s had rolled in, a lot of the hero treatments of the 1930s began to drop out of use. This was part due to improvements in psychology and in medications that bypassed the need for physical intervention. Although when used on the correct patient and in modified form, ECT had a greater efficacy than the old brain poking, but it still fell out of use. It didn't go away. You see, it did work, and into the 1980s a more controlled form was used on particular individuals who needed the treatment under strict medical supervision. But that wasn't the case everywhere, and here is the man you've probably been waiting the whole video for me to talk about. Tesla Trooper Yang. This is Yang, and he is a psychologist based in the 4th Hospital of Linyi, Linyi Mental Hospital which hilariously has 34 one-star reviews on Google. No surprise when you hear what Yang has been getting up to. You don't get the name like Electric Shock Madman Yang for nothing, and spoiler, the shock was ECT. Yang thought that unmodified ECT would be perfect for treating internet-addicted teenagers. Electric shocks and no anesthesia. Yang had gone old school. He began his studies into internet addiction in 1999, and by 2006, he was using ECT regularly to treat his addicted victims. This will culminate in the 2008 TV show that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Yang had created a rather lucrative business, charging roughly $800 a month to the parents of the internet addicted individuals. This epitomized the negative public image towards ECT, that it was just medicalized torture. In Yang's case, it probably was torture. One of his more concerning quotes when talking about his therapy was that ECT is only painful for those with internet addiction. Jeez. Of course, he didn't get informed consent from his underage patients. China would actually ban the use of ECT for internet addiction in 2009, after which Yang started using lower voltage pulse electronic acupuncture because that's a thing now there's a lot more to yang's story so let me know in the comments if you'd like a full video on this guy so in conclusion ect is a bit of a mixed bag it does work for some but has been abused a lot during its 90 or so years of use in its current form the introduction of more controllable waveforms and pulse types has made the treatment ever more effective it's nowhere near as horrific as the lobotomy which even that still has its uses in modern day medicine. So it's rating time. I'm going to give this one six Thunderbolts out of 10. This is a plain difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike license. 
Blame Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in the currently sunny corner of southern London, UK. I'd like to thank my Patreons and YouTube members for your financial support, as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week. I have Instagram and Twitter, so check them out if you want to see behind the scenes images and all sorts of random stuff. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching, and Mr Music, play us out please. Side 2 Thank you.